their own historical interests. So then, and now you might want to take a look back at your blue papers because there were so many good ideas that are related to themes. Uh, if you'll take that orchid colored post-it note and identify if you had to focus on only two themes. And you couldn't have but two themes in this historical museum. It's like, what are your top two? What are your top two? They may be fishing, or they may be the relationships among the families and the stories of the families that settled. Um, but what are the two themes that you would want to make sure were part of this museum?
this list. <laughs>
the community center alone forever. And uh, so we got busy with our landscaping plans and then we were about to come to culmination when we found out that the city had now decided to put a building in the front yard. So we started over and we have a new landscape design and I think you've got it up here somewhere. I'm the, I'm the display copper counter next to the And uh, so we're into bidding process right now. We're starting this week to go out and get prices for everything. Beth Dash, who is a resident of Port A, full-time employee at the Chamber, is also a landscape person and uh, has been in that business most of her life. And she has done the drawing for us. And so we worked with the Historical Association getting some of their input and trying to figure out, you know, putting some benches. We were, quite a few of us, especially Bruce and I, were surprised when we spent time just sitting in front of the community center in the car, looking at it and talking about different things. How many people actually walk in that area? I had no idea there was so, so much foot traffic in that part of our town. And so we decided we definitely needed places for people to sit, get out of the sun, get away from the wind. So we've incorporated that and it worked out real well with the museum going in there because um, they need the same things. So that's what's been incorporated into this design. It'll have a lot of water features in it and uh, a lot of benches and just a very pleasant landscape. And we are getting started. And that is very exciting. And one of the, uh, if you were looking at an expense and a funding option, then she's just illustrated one for us because an expense is the landscaping. And the Garden Club is donating and working with other organizations to help uh, gather <coughs> funding for this project. Yes, we're going to be asking other organizations as well as individuals uh, or companies in town if it's something that we need not just to donate money but actually to donate the service that they do provide to try to get more of it done and if what we can't get done we'll just it'll be next year's project and the following year's project so the more cooperation we get the more complete the look will be and then we have two boatmen here tonight and i went over um, to look at the plaque in front of the community center today just to see exactly what it said. And it says Which isn't being moved. <laughs> and it says <laughs> that just just like it the, the Boatman Association bought that land and then um, gave it to the city so that the community could build, that's what it says on the marker, in 1949 so that the community could um, have the community center there. Now Marcy's going, I don't know, but uh, someone called well, me. I know, I know exactly what happened. I had copies of the papers and everything. The women of the community church donated that land to the city of Port Aransas for a community center. And there was an association then called the Community Center Association. And I have the a list of the gentlemen who signed it. A bunch of them were boatmen, but not all of them. And they had regular meetings, regular parties. Rick said, how regular were the parties? I think that that's just why it's so important to have all these voices and all these experiences in the room because um, you know, there are lots of uh, different sides of history, lots of different <laughs> stories and experiences. But, <laughs> Kathy, you mentioned a moment ago that the city was indeed considering flattening the, the community center. The person who stopped that is Beverly Charles. Well, I can stop it. I can make a motion. One person never stops anything, especially in a town like uh, all I did was well. All I did was make a motion, but thank you, Rick. Uh, it's this town has gotten so excited about the history, and uh, and that has made it uh, so much easier for Rick, who's very supportive of history and is a city council person, and me, who's supportive of history and a city council person, to be able to partner up and. It takes a quorum to get anything done up there, four people. So a 
group of people say that, and I think that's neat because it could have been for those. Well, we, we do want to work together figuring out what exactly the story happened. Is. I mean, I've, been, I've spent an hour this afternoon talking to uh, Lloyd Dreyer. I'm, I'm meeting with him tomorrow evening, trying all his information down, and I guess he's yes. still, and he, and I'm not, I'm, you're right, I'm just telling you what he said. But he said it was donated by, the land was donated by Spanning Gibbs? No. No. Y'all gotta help me here. No. That's what he said. Fanny Gibbs owned um, the Gibbs Cottages and he did not own that property. So, I have he was, along he's got along. a list of about six guys here that worked with him to, to help build it. We're telling there, him about there how more than that. that. You can count more than that. Uh, the yeah, he, he, he can only remember about five or six. Yeah, I know. We got a, it's like a puzzle. Yeah. It is. That's a beautiful way to describe it. Yeah. And there's a lot of misunderstanding out there. And so we, we just want to work with everybody to try to get everything straight if we can. The boat has a wonderful archive over in the library. Uh, okay. It's a wonderful archive. But yeah, one good story that, that I don't think anybody can debate. And that was that the oak floor, flooring was so hard that they started bruising and cutting their hands up trying to pound nails through it. They ended up getting a drill and drilling the holes for the oak floor, and that's how they finally got the oak floor put in. So there we go. We got we got Agreed common, on that common one. ground. I love what David just said because that's a great metaphor. It is like a puzzle, and everybody has a piece of the story that makes the puzzle fit together about this town's history. And we're fortunate that we do have long-term residents like Marcy and. I don't know Mr. Dreyer, but that are around to still tell us the stories and put the pieces together. So, on that note, if you'll go around your table and identify an expense, and yeah. Kathy's question was uh, starting with right now when we still have to move it over there, and then a funding option for the expense that you name. Are we both right now? No, if your recorder will just write it directly on the paper. One from each person.
responsibility that the group you are here representing might be willing to take on. And if you'll write that on the post-it note and then just put it on the sheet that has community groups role and responsibilities at the top. Right. And they're good about uh, helping you know, 
the first key, so maybe this week, month, the fire department or the fire auxiliary can clean, do floors, clean the bathrooms. Wonderful. These are things that are yeah. have to be done, but the organization can be heard maybe on a weekly basis. That's a great idea. Okay, anyone else? I, uh, um, Nancy? I was well, just going to say, the only organization I'm here is the Papaha. And I think our whole goal is inspiration and coordination, not dictating. It's bringing it all together, whatever you want to make it work. That's all. Marcy? Uh, the Catholic Church is the oldest church here on the island. And uh, the families that belong to it are some of the oldest, like the old Roberts. I'm not talking about Porter Roberts, uh, but John G. Roberts. Uh, and the Mercers and the Matthews and the Bouillons and anyway, all these people, I am working real hard right now trying to get the family histories from everyone and they are very slowly coming in and I'm thrilled to that. Great, great. I'm even going to get one from the Farleys. <laughs> and Marcy has made incredible scrapbooks and if you haven't seen them, it's worth uh, checking in with her and you know get a private showing them. There are many <laughs> scrapbooks. Okay. Right. There's a fundraising opportunity. Yes, that's right. That's right. That's right. We can always show. No, I think they should pay to be in the museum. <laughs> if you want your family in the museum, you have to pay. <laughs> Great. Uh, just to mirror what uh, Nancy had to say. That it's in our job as administration, bringing it all together. Tommy? Very well. First, I have to say that the art is um, entirely dependent on doing the same thing that we're trying to do, which is raising funds, including keeping people that we employ. And we have to raise all our money by donation to the university. It does not support us financially in any way. So, that always gives us a bit of a problem with them because we're always in competition to raise money with other organizations. Anyway, but we would be certainly willing to um, donate history of wildlife rehabilitation and the sea turtle story, the recovery. There are lots of archives on that. As for UTMSI, um, there's a lot of, I think you really need to find somebody else from UTMSI for this. Um, other than myself. But uh, we have a lot of materials and equipment of historical kind of oceanographic stuff and, um, that uh, is accumulating in our warehouse. And some of it's pretty interesting and uh, would, would make good donations for the physical part of the museum. Oh, I'm here, you know, just uh, as a member of the Bowmans, there, there's a due process that you have to go through this speaking for the membership. But I know there's some individuals that are members of the Bowman and part of this community that want to do something. And there's a, you know, what that history is, we're going to piece the puzzle together. There's a, there's a bunch of folks over there that are members of the Bowman that have a, a fondness and some kind of a, an attachment to that community center. And, uh, and, and they've talked in the past about wanting to do stuff. It's, Tough getting all the boatmen together on something. A lot of guys are making a living out on the water, and that's kind of tough. You know, they're there. It's almost kind of like a trade group in some respects. But uh, I think a lot of them are going to want to, you know, like myself, spend some time helping restore the community center. I have. I guess we'll get the question with you eventually. But you know, I understand that there's a chance the community center could maybe also become an endangered uh, building and its association with the Mercer House can make the help in that regard. So that's a good thing. I'd like to see that happen. I'm speaking as an individual now, I guess, uh, a little bit more. Uh, but, uh, you know, by God, we're going to save those wood both, both floors. Sure. <laughs> on my deathbed, they'll be safe. <laughs> you probably can't destroy them. No, you can't. Blood, sweat, and tears are mingled with the yeah. stain. Um, I'm with Marcy. Okay. Kristen? Um, let's see. 
contact craft before that will probably bring things appropriate to the you I think you were here um, before, but the Art Center already done a cooperative thing with mm -hmm. Papa when they, they put up a display of the old photograph. Right. And uh, it brought people into the Art Center, but it also, right. we sold a lot of photographs. So that, right. that's a good example of how you know, uh, cooperative fundraising came between two of you. It's great. Uh, thank you. <coughs> always adequately staffed. But we also should think in terms of a supervisory group for this so that they can keep records and can report at a proper interval quarterly perhaps to Papa and any other organization that wishes to be contacted. And then I think that we would be the continuous awareness of the project over all period of time and we should have this opportunity to run articles regularly so that they, everyone in town and everyone who gets the South Jetty by mail knows it and we could send these to the uh, nearby community papers and let everybody know what's going on. Yeah. You have that
Walter Raleigh established the Lost Colony, and uh, they indeed got lost and created that mystery and then uh, uh, and disappeared. Uh, and it's a mystery that's nearly never been solved. But uh, they hadn't done much about their history in spite of the fact that they had such a great and illustrious history. And so we were involved in building an 8,000 square foot uh, exhibit for them, brand new startup museum called Festival Park. Uh, cost over a million dollars to do. Uh, as, I, as I listen to you tonight and, and, and been thinking about all the components of your history, you have just as rich a history as they do. And just as an important history, but we're talking about 800 square feet here, and they have 8,000. Well, what, what's the difference? Well, at some point in time, uh, you know, you, you need to, to take your history and put it in the context of where it really belongs in this state, and then to to begin to tap the state and its resources to to help you. Because that's what they did. The uh, State of North Carolina gave them five or six million dollars, and they built this big uh, festival park exhibit and some other things. I'm not saying that that's what you've got to do now, but I, that's that's the way that it starts: is beginning to to see where where you fit in the context. And as I, as I prepared to come over here, I began to think about the significance of this place, and, it, and it's really exciting because here or within five miles radius of where you are for the most part, transpired all the romantic elements of, of, uh, of U.S. history. It, it's, it's all here from uh, pirates to uh, uh, ships, from cowboys and the Indians, from Civil War battles, uh, the important Civil War battles at that. Uh, Hardly any place in Texas can claim uh, you know, that kind of history being fought on, uh, on its soil. Uh, you've got a story that we discussed at this table of the prehistory here, that you know, the, the Broncos and their predecessors were the first one in Texas. You know, when, the barrier, when the Barrier Islands appeared, that's where the Indians came. They came and spent the winters here. And, the, and wherever there's Barrier Islands in Texas, there were the Broncos Indians. And, uh, and that story is being uh, documented uh, almost as we speak. And so there, there, is, there is that element. And then, of course, we can look at the Spanish exploration. Uh, LaSalle and his party uh, was just up to the north. And then, of course, you know the story of the history of Mexico and Texas. And, and of course, Mexico, when uh, the Texas Revolution was fought, how do you think that the, uh, uh, the Mexican army supplied its troops? Well, they came right through here. And the Texas Army supplying its troops. They came right through here. No other place in the state can uh, can make those claims. And then, then you move into the, the closer to the modern era and the competition for the ship channel and then the ship channel itself becoming the Coast Guard, the lighthouse station, the Coast Guard, the impact of the Mexican War, the Civil War on the area. Uh, and then, of course, you move into the modern era and we talk about uh, fishing and its importance. And, and on we've come right up to uh, modern times and, and uh, you know some critical things that have taken place in building the highway up the, up the island or the state taking over the ferry operations all of those are important things that need to be told in uh, in your in your exhibits and uh, it's, it's a great story it's as good as anybody's story anywhere in the country and uh, so it, it's here and it's really exciting to Think of that. I am so impressed with uh, what this organization has done in such a short time to, for example, to, to get the historic survey, the grant historic survey, to get the, to get the house donated uh, and uh, thus have a, uh, uh, and a place to move it. And I'm impressed with the, the literally the very advanced thinking that I've heard tonight. Uh, I was a little skeptical when I came because I, I felt like, you know, well, maybe we're starting at ground zero. And that's not the case at all. You, you folks have thought through this process very well, and you hit all of the right elements in developing uh, the, the ideas that you put forward. Uh, and I'm impressed with the, the uh, arduous task that you're trying to do. Because not only are you trying to have a museum, you're also trying to save the town and you're trying to save the culture. Uh, 
somebody mentioned the A-Lane Highway that's, uh, that's coming. Uh, you know, uh, the face of Port Aransas is indeed going to, to change, but it doesn't have to uh, change completely because there's a way to save your overall historic fabric, and you're beginning in the right way. You begin to save these, these historic properties, and so indeed we do want to save the face of your town, and you want to save your artifacts and your records. And you want to interpret your artifacts as it is. So I would say your timing is, is really great because uh, you know this area is enjoying the prosperity that it's that it's never known before, and its population growth is just continuing to accelerate. And and that works to your advantage because more people need more money and need more taxes and and so forth. And uh, so the opportunity is there. Uh, you have uh, some ambitious exhibit ideas, and uh, you need about 8,000 square feet to put those in. So the challenge will be to uh, to what to start with, and uh, we'll bring some uh, we'll bring some ideas to you, um, you know. And, but we'll also recommend to you that you don't clutter your space. You know the problem with with uh, uh, small local museums is. They, they try to exhibit everything they've got, and thus it becomes a, a clutter. When in, in fact, most museums exhibit less than 10% of the artifacts that they hold in any one given time, and that's one of the things we would advise you to do. That you you have professionally prepared and uh, designed exhibits uh, done so that you start out right and you make the right impression. But one of the things that you can do, uh, we've done before, is to uh, since your space is limited, then say if, if uh, the number of exhibit panels is 15 that will go in that space, then we do, uh, we do 25 exhibit panels. And then at a certain point in time, you change those out, and, and thus you, you have a recurring program. I heard somebody mention that. What did we do to get people to come back? Well, that's all involved in the program. And so if you build that into the exhibit program, then you have a, you have a good start on that. Uh, so you have a you have a great potential, and the house uh, will become a, a centerpiece for a, a museum as well as a, a, to enhance your community center. And if your museum does nothing else, if it tells how the community center was built, it will just do. Funding is always a problem, and uh, you know it doesn't come cheaply. Uh, museums, particularly if you're going to use professionally designed exhibits, but I, I'm I'm here to tell you that museums raise lots of money in in this state, and uh, my challenge to you is to start thinking big. Uh, don't think in terms of hundred dollars, but think in terms of hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, and uh, began to brainstorm on uh, resources and foundations that can make uh, make that possible. Um, uh, I'm a little reluctant to talk about marriages with the city, for example, because I don't know what city politics here are, but one thing that mo many museums do is they have partnerships with their city where the city pays salaries of, of the museum workers. and, and you know, the city of Port Aransas will owe something uh, back to this group for putting in a uh, first class museum and visitor center. And one of the things, the way they repay that in the marriage works is for the city to take on a portion of that cost, by, particularly by funding the, uh, the salary of the people that you might have. So uh, that's just my general impression. I just wanted to tell you how impressed I am with, with this exercise. I knew it would be good because I know Beverly is, is, is an expert at this sort of thing as well. But, uh, and our role will be to try to, uh, to guide you along. Uh, the contract that we are negotiating with the organization is that we will prepare a prospectus for uh, the museum. And, and this prospectus will define what it will be, what it will look like, the storyline for the exhibits. And uh, that prospectus then will become a fundraising tool that you can go to a major foundation 
like the Meadows Foundation or, or uh, HEB and others and say, here's our plan. Uh, this is what it's going to cost, and we want you to get, you know, X thousands of dollars. And, uh, you know, the old adage, you knock on 10 doors to get one, one sale, works with foundations as well. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a process that you have to go through, but it's certainly doable. And I, I don't think it's impossible at all for you to raise somewhere between three and $500,000 to uh, do what you want. So, any questions that you have of me at this point? Are you doing that?